So let's get started. And um, today, the Finance Minister presents the 2023 budget. Now, today's budget is important because as we seek an IMF program, this budget is expected to largely indicate what the plans are or what the agreements with the IMF are. Well, what we do know is that according to the Finance Minister, all things being equal by end of December 2023, we may reach a staff level agreement with the IMF. But while we wait for that staff level agreement, what are the things that we can do that will take us there in making sure that one, we're debt sustainable and two, we're able to secure the IMF agreement. This morning, we're joined by former finance minister, Seth Tekbe, who I'm sure in 2014 found himself, uh, you know, in a similar situation by this time. And also, Dr. Mark Asibeyabwa, who is a former member of parliament for New Jabbing South and a former chairman of the Finance Committee in Parliament. Seth Tekbe, good morning, and good morning to you, Dr. Marcus Ibeyabwa. Yes, good morning. Yeah, good morning to you, and uh, good morning to your viewers on Facebook and uh, other media and listeners. Yes, briefly, let me just uh, get your you know take on this, uh, Mr. Seth Tekbe. So today, as we expect the Finance Minister to present the 2023 budget, broadly, what is it that you are expecting in that document? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, as your introduction <clears throat> indicated, uh, it's not just me, it's Ghanaians, it's the global community. And when I say the global community, uh, we're talking at the, of the IMF itself. Uh, some discussions have been held with them. Uh, but we're also talking about the markets, the markets that have been downgrading us, the markets which is expecting us to come up, you know, with a budget particularly, with respect to our debt situation, which we, as we know is a debt sustainability condition, you know, that is also hanging. Uh, hopefully we would hear about that. We do have others like the multilater other multilateral agencies, particularly the World Bank that would be providing, you know, budget support together with African Development Bank and development partners. So you can see that the list is long. And I must say that the, delay, if I may put it that way, in or the upfront presentation of government's contents of government's enhanced program, you know, which apparently is the basis on which the um, discussions have started with the fund, uh, I would say, and the secrecy around what is going on with the discussions has, um, I would say, raise expectations, you know, very high expectations with respect to this budget. And it is my desire in the interest of the nation and given the condition, you know, in which we are now, and I believe we'll be talking about it, that this will meet, you know, go a long way in meeting the expectation. And we will not be repeating the situation with a media review, you know, where immediately after the presentation, all that followed were downgrades you know, and, you know, a very, and which led to some of the situation which we face ourselves. Of course, some of that situation, you know, are homegrown to use, you know, that, that expression. Uh, let me say um, by way of clarifying the introduction that you will recall that, uh, yes, we did the IMF program, but we entered into the 2015 IMF program two years ahead of we in our very first budget, 2014, and followed by 2015, indicating the indices or the expectations of a homegrown policy, which we eventually went to Sinti to discuss all of this ahead, ahead of, you know, the discussions or negotiations, you know, with the IMF. And in fact, that document, you know, was substantially the basis on which the negotiations were held. So you can contrast that with the situation in which we have now. And uh, this is the reason in which I'm saying that expectations have been raised against the background of the media review and some secrecy surrounding the enhanced, you know, program. So I hope that Ghanaians and the list of, you know, those I've mentioned, uh, you know, will be met, you know, today. Okay. Dr. Sibe uh, what should we be putting in the budget to kickstart the transformation that we need in this economy? Uh, primarily, um, the budget should restore macro stability. 
So the macro in this uh, inflation, the budget deficit, uh, interest rates, we should see the movement after the implementation of the budget in 2023 in the indices. Again, we have to return the debt to sustainable level. The debt is unsustainable as we speak. And so what are the ingredients in the budget that will return the debt to levels that are sustainable? Again, there should be social protection. So spending in the health sector, education, uh, all of these will be captured in the budget. So uh, employment, is there going to be some um, rigidity in terms of hiring into the public sector? Because we, are, we have been engaging the fund for some, for some time now. And so whatever uh, the cuttings and agreements have been reached would be captured in the budget. So essentially, your budget is bringing in revenue measures, and then we want to see the expenditure rationalization there into, as we speak, organized labor is demanding a 60% increase in salary. Um, government is stuck at 20%. Uh, that, I don't think that will work. There has to be some middle ground. It has implications for the budget. So, um, in about three, four hours, we could uh, have a fair idea of uh, what has been captured in the budget. But as uh, Mr. Tepe said, uh, the budget is not for just the Ghanaian audience. Investors are watching. Uh, multilateral agencies are paying attention. Uh, bilateral. So uh, it, it is critical for us to get this right this time. Mm. Uh, Dr. Marcus today joins us on phone. Seth Pepe joins us via Zoom and we're thinking about the budget. Um, uh, if I may, Dr. Isidei Abwa, uh, we are already getting hints of uh, the plans of government to increase the VAT rate, possibly, and also to implement the property rates regime, which, uh, <laughs> well, has been on the uh, table since the very beginning of um, the president's first term. Now, let's start with the VAT increase. Uh, are you for this or against it? Okay, so 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 once we are entering into a program with a fund, the fund will not assign onto a program, and then three years later, uh, the program would have been built or or the results would not have been achieved. So they are in discussions with government to um, reduce the deficit. And also to um, return the debt to sustainable level. Now, it, 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 the deficit just will cause the revenue less expenditure, and our expenditure has always exceeded our revenue. And so, if you want a fund program, they will insist that you have to uh, bring in some revenue measures. Uh, I recall in 2015 when we were in in the same position, my friend said introduce a 2.5% back increase on the excess price of petroleum products. Those ones are guaranteed because we know that uh, uh, demand for the goods in elastic and then the revenue will come in. But now we can't touch uh, petroleum. We all know where the price of petroleum products are. The e levy hasn't worked as expected. So you go to VAT, you know how much is coming in. And so that a 2% or 2.5% increase, yes, that is guaranteed. So uh, we are caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, we have to uh, bring in revenue measures. And if you look around, the easiest now, low hanging fruit will be the increase in VAT. Then on property rates, property rates already exist. Collection has been inefficient. So I want to hear the new uh, approaches. 
that that are going to be used to rake in the needed uh, uh, property revenue. I also hear that the national fiscal stabilization levy is going to be expanded so that more more sectors uh, will be captured. We already have the mining and banking insurance telcos captured in there, but a few more would be brought in. And then also we would, we would want to see the benchmark revenue eliminated completely. So that would be the revenue side. So it brings in something. Maybe all of these measures can bring in some 10, 12 billion. That's huge. Mm. But then the other side of the point is that what are you doing to cut down expenditure? I haven't heard anything on that front, and I would want to see some some movement in that direction. Yes, and, and, and Doc, talking about expenditure, so you've talked about reducing deficit. Shouldn't we, and, and at this time that we're going through all the challenges we're going through as a nation, shouldn't we be focusing more on expenditure and expanding our revenue generation instead of increasing rates? I agree. I agree completely with you. There are two sides to uh, the deficit with that thinking. As a matter of fact, expenditure cuts are the reason. Because that one, you know how much you are spending on, say, nursing and teacher training allowance. So once you, you take it off, you know the savings there. So uh, I, I, I don't want to run ahead of the minister. Maybe there are some expenditure cuts I haven't heard. What I've heard on the revenue front is what I laid out. But I don't know if there are serious uh, expenditure cuts. I mean, we, we need that at this time, too. Yeah. One thing about the funds, and, and Fed, Fed knows this better, they, they are not going to force you into cutting expenditure. No. They, they can't come and say, oh, you're free, and uh, let it go, do this. No, the IMF will not do that. You have to come up. That's why he said in 2014 they had a homegrown uh, program. You have to come up with a program. There's an enhanced domestic program on the table now, which will be the basis for the fund program. And we have to see some expenditure cuts in there. I haven't had anything that gives me comfort. Right. Um, Dr. Sibir, well, there are some who suggest that every single year, the biggest expenditure item on our budget is actually inefficiencies. And that if we were able to block the loopholes, we would be in a position where we could even reduce some of the taxes rather than increase them. Uh, an example that is always cited is our ports, where we are reportedly losing billions of dollars every year. Uh, would you have uh, considered it a, a better approach for government to outline some very stringent measures to block l leakages with some very uh, you know, uh, healthy targets set on that? Rather than the low-hanging fruit, would you would you have expected them to take the tougher choices than the you know the, the easier ones that will hit our pockets harder? Yeah, I, I, I always go back to that because uh, both of us work together for uh, a period. Every budget document has had compliance measures, uh, reducing the efficiencies in them, the savings. Now the fund is telling uh, government that the savings that you make from the compliance and uh, uh, improving efficiency, uh, it will be less than 1% of GDP. So they, they are not taking it. You know, you have to come up with measures that will uh, restore macro stability, reduce the deficit. So when, when you tell them, I'm going to enforce compliance, I'm going to improve efficiency. They say, well, in the past, you have said all of this, it hasn't brought in uh, uh, even 1% uh, of GDP uh, uh, increase. So, Mind you, we talk about the ports and the, the people there. We can't take all of them away and bring uh, new persons in there. It's the same group of people everywhere, wherever we go we're in our life. So I will not go there now. It is a systemic problem that it will take a long time to improve some of these things. Are you going to change all customs officials and bring new people there? There was a time we even tried using national security people at the post. It didn't work. So, <laughs> if you are entering into a program like this, you have to show them how you are uh, maybe raising 
of GDP revenue. And these are the measures you have to throw to the fund before you, they can sign on to a program with you. Okay. Now, I'll get back to you, but let me sure. go to, you know, Seth Tepe on, uh, you know, this point. But even before I get to Seth Tepe, you've talked about the things we've been talking in the past. Now, GRA tells us now that because of the implementation of EVAT, for instance, uh, they've seen persons who hitherto were paying 300,000 VAT beginning to pay 3 million. Now, that's something you can actually make reference to and say, if we're to expand this to cover the whole country, you'll be able to increase revenue generation, isn't it, uh, Dr. S. B. Yeah, um, it's true. And uh, they, uh, if that, uh, we even had uh, passed the law, uh, the Fiscal Electronic uh, Devices Act, which were basically to uh, bring in cash registers so that anybody that's supposed to be charging but will have these cash registers so that once you ring the cash register, it records at the back end in the Revenue Authority yeah. uh, office. You know, we haven't done the hard, hard work in uh, bringing revenue because in the past we relied on uh, the capital markets, the refinancing our debt. I think now we are getting back to basics. This is uh, the time that we are now beginning to roll out the hardcore policies, pay attention to details, and and so it's a start. But let's do these side by side as we enforce compliance and then improve efficiency. One or two of these uh, tax measures uh, uh, have to come in. Sir hmm. Tukbe, so you you are a tax expert. Currently, if you are to go and buy anything, uh, COVID nineteen uh, levy, uh, you know VAT of um, some, uh, you know twelve point five percent, get fund levy and NHI levy, all amounting to eighteen point five, and in you know some places the Ghana tourism levy also one percent you're paying about 19.5%. Should we be considering, is it appropriate to think of increasing VAT by some 2 to 3% at this point in time when we're going through challenges when our disposable income is so little? Well, thank you very much. Um, and it's important that you put the rates in a, in a proper perspective. A lot has happened to VAT in this country. Um, <clears throat> VAT was introduced at a 10% or reintroduced at a 10% back in um, 1995, 96, through when it failed and reintroduced uh, at a 10% to make it feasible you know, uh, in 1998, but effectively 1999. This is important. This is a kumi prequera uh, because the 10% was actually a response in a substantial way, you know, to um, lowering the rates so that the, the VAT can be introduced, you know, uh, a bit more easily because of the distortions, you know, which were brought to bear on the introduction of the VAT. Now, we sought to increase the VAT rate because 10% was not sustainable by bringing a national health, first get fund and a second national health insurance. These two taxes have been called, you know, substantively, effectively VAT, and they are connected as though they were a VAT. Now, why do we say they were a v as though they were a VAT? The main feature of VAT, which we moved away from, which made us move away from the sales tax and the service taxes, Remember, I mentioned service taxes. And electronic levy is not new. You know, DSTV used to be itemized, you know, when it came in. Uh, it was then Mobitel and others. They came in when it was itemized. Today, we are going back, as it seems, as if we are introducing or reintroducing these service taxes. But let me get back to VAT. So fast forward. The main feature of VAT is that it is a tax on the consumer. It is not a tax on the business, which is an intermediary, what? For the production of that goods or services that is supplied. And two, as agents for collection. So when they collect the tax, they are given a relief, which we call the input tax credit or input VAT credit. That is, they are allowed to offset the tax they pay on their inputs against the tax that they charge, you know, and this continues among businesses until 
it hits the consumer. So ideally, by the time the commodity hits the consumer, there will be no tax which was paid on inputs. And I said ideally, because it's not the world is not ideal. But substantially, you can say that up to 80-90% of taxes paid on inputs, which pass through the ideal VAT regime, would not be added to cost because businesses are getting it back. What did we see? Around about 2018-2019, the GET fund and the, the and this is very important, the GET fund and the NHIF were removed from the base of the VAT. And this is why I said it was it, it was, you know, you were right in adding it to the VAT because they are substantially VAT. But we were removed from the VAT base with the sole purpose, you know, of denying businesses the right to the input tax credit. Now, when you deny business any indirect tax, and you can list them from excise to import duty to the sales tax that used to be, and in fact, the old six tax even has something called a rate, you know, which we may not have time to go into to alleviate the tax on inputs. All these indirect taxes, anytime the business is just an agent for collection. So anytime you deny them the credit, they will add it to cost. So we shouldn't be surprised that, you know, there's a cost push inflation being caused by the this remover, denial of input tax credit. In fact, the most inefficient aspect of it is that when you export, today when we export, we are adding those costs. Even though there are some relief measures, we are adding those costs mm. and imposing them on our on us. So our exports is not efficient. Okay. If our exports are zero rated, and that means that once you are exporting the commodity under the original regime, then all taxes that you pay, the output VAT will be zero. So, so when you offset your input tax as a business, you know, you get a refund. So by making the NHIL and the DA, uh, sorry, the NH, NHIL and the get fund, fund. so cost straight levies, you have inadvertently increased cost. You have inadvertently increased, you know, even the effective rate of the So, VA. Mr. Techman, based on all so, that you've said to us, would it be prudent to consider increasing the rate of VAT? Well, even if you increase it, I want to, I want to caution you know, that we should not raise our expectations too high because we have effectively increased the VAT rate to 19%. Now, a phenomenon that is happening, and it's in the government's own figures, if we were on TV, I would, you know, demonstrate it, is that VAT, which has the widest base today, is falling behind income tax, corporate income tax and personal income tax because of these anomalies. Now, secondly, the domestic tax division of GRA is not fully automated. You remember the raft of revenue measures that were started under Professor Mills, the creation, you know, changing the RAGD to the Ghana Revenue Authority, merger of the uh, IRS with, uh, uh, with the VAT service to create a domestic tax division, was to be underpinned by a significant automation, mm. you know, which led to, if you recall, uh, uh, the West Blue initiative or single window initiative, which today has become ICOMS, which used to operate alongside GCNET. You recall all that, you know, confusion. But there was a revenue modernization phase too. And uh, uh, Dr. CB is right. You know, when you are implementing compliance and administrative measures, they take time to materialize. And that is why these things were initiated back in 2009. Okay. You would also recall that we revamped, and Dr. Sibir was on the committee, we revamped all the tax laws that we have in the country, all of them, including the PFMA, which is on the expenditure side, to try and modernize the operations. Now, the automation of the domestic tax uh, for the domestic tax division of GRA stopped, which was to be the main thing in the uh, modernization phase two. It stopped. So, 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 I understand there has been tenders. No contract has been awarded. 
Yes, but that, coming back to you, Mr. Tech, you, that, you, you, you made a point earlier. Let me give a bit of a clarification. You, you made a point earlier. You talked about the fact that if we increase it by 2% or 2.5%, we're not going to get anything because we've increased it already. In the 2022 budget, for instance, uh, after the mid-year review, the government projects 15 billion from VAT. If you look at the indicative value for 2023, uh, you're probably looking at some 17, 18 billion. Now, if you're looking at that, and you were to convert the 12.5 into 100%, and you were adding 2.5%, you're looking at 15% more. 15% more. But that is, that, is the anomaly, that is the anomaly I was pointing out. Yes. <laughs> you see, you are using 12.5 because today it is only the 12.5. You can only get your refund and input tax credit on only the 12.5. Exactly. The 5 remains, and we call them straight levies instead yes. of NHIL. And get fund. Yes. And for those ones, you don't get input tax credit and you don't get refund, basically. So you add the tax that you paid on input to cost, you know, which increases. And this is the point I'm making that there has been a, an inherent increase in the VAT, you know, already. Yeah. That, that was in 2018. Uh, point, that was in 2018. The other point which I'd but like to add now... on this one is that as we speak, we talk so much about e levy, but are you aware? that we have on the books 16 levies that have been introduced and it includes the fiscal stabilization levy one of the reasons we cannot introduce is that the ones that were introduced as far back as uh, 2015 when the crude oil uh, prices fell together with the import duty are still there and we have added fintech levy we have a uh, pollution levy we have 15 levies so you can add all of this in fact we did a calculation, and all of these revenues are bringing in a paltry 4.5%. Are we going to continue to keep all this, which, as I said earlier, resembles service taxes? So there have been significant increases in taxes. You know, we always go back to 2017 and point to the fact that a lot of taxes were removed. But even the personal income tax, you know, rate has gone up. You know, it went up to 35%. There was a backlash. It came down to 30% from 25%. But mm. I'm pointing to, besides the VAT that we are talking about, I'm pointing to the fact that we currently have 16 levies on our books, and mm. I can send them to you, you know, uh, if you want to go through them. Yeah, and so, uh, 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 Mr. Yeah. Tech, if, 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 because you've mentioned the e-levy a number of times, and yes, you're right, there are other levies we need to think of, but what would your position be on the e-levy? Bearing in mind how, if you know, if, if we were to measure it against the target they set, the e-levy has spectacularly failed to hit its target. Uh, should should uh, the finance ministry be considering scrapping it? I have been fundamentally opposed to the e-levy, but if we are going to bring in the e-levy, it's for me it should be in the nature of the temporary taxes that we used to introduce in the past which were basically two, import, a uh, temporary import, you know, duty, and then also a uh, fiscal or national stabilization levy, which the Rawlings administration, before administration, Mills, you know, and the uh, Mahama administration have all introduced, but removed, but which have been retained since the Mahama administration, elements of it by the current administration. The other reason why I'm not enthusiastic about the E-Levy is that you know, you mentioned either you or, or Winston in, in the list of, you know, things that had to be insurance and all those things. You know, is a yield levy a consumption tax? Or it is a levy that's on everything, including your loans that you take from the bank and you put on your wallet and then you transmit. You know, you see the scramble to try and remove some of these things. That was what made, you know, the yield levy, one of the reasons the yield levy failed because it was poorly structured. Because if you took a loan, as a businessman, and uh, previously you would have put it in the back of your, you know, your vehicle to go and pay your workers in the field. Today you can send it by e If you send it either through your bank, you know, through sorry, electronic means, or it will be taxed. Why are we taxing low? Today, if you went to put your money, your salary, you know, uh, in your in your wallet after it has been taxed already, PAYE. 
and I work with you and I have my wallet in my, I have my money in my leather wallet in my pocket, or I have my money in my pocket, in my physical cash, not in the wallet. And two of us walk in and you pay by, uh, you know, by your electronic wallet, you'll be taxed. Whereas, you know, you and Winston who walk in and is, Winston is not using, you know, electric, uh, uh, electronic means, but it's paying, will not be taxed. But both of you are going to pay VAT. You are going to pay the yield levy in addition to the VAT, right? That is on, you know, salary. That's on your savings. You know, you are being taxed on your savings because you, you've taxed. What should be taxed is the consumption, the item you are going to buy. That is VAT, excise duty, if it's alcohol, tobacco, etc. So the VAT is the yield levy itself, you know, needs refinement. And as I said, it is not new. Electronic, whether anything electronic, whether from DSTV, those days and others, were all revamped. You can go back as your uh, uh, your producers to go back and look there. The laws are not difficult, are not easy to find, but you can go back and look at Act 500, Act 501, and Act 529. This gives you a summary of service taxes that were canceled and became part of the VAT. Today, we are just reintroducing them by way of levy and we are making it by the way we are making it very difficult for gre to administer the tax can you imagine you know administering one tax called vat which has all which is all encompassing of goods and services one tax and you are replacing them with about 20 levies and the vat itself which has been split into three hmm. right and mind you, then you also have the VAT flat rate scheme, you know, in place. Now you are introducing a VAT withholding scheme on domestic. It has been extended to the import. We are making it very, very difficult for VRA to administer the tax and for businesses to comply with the tax. Mm. The tax regime was simplified, but we have gone back to making it very, very complex. And so right. I would have rather expected that this budget would go back and start simplify the tax regime. Mm -hmm. When you simplify the tax regime and you lower rates, you know, and you don't do them backdoor through levies, mm -hmm. you prevent tax evasion and avoidance. And that is why we are not generating much, you know, right. from the VAT because there's rampant tax evasion okay. and avoidance, you know, including the port, as you yeah. mentioned. Yeah. Now, Dr. Marcus I mean, in your uh, preliminary comments, you talked about you know, restoring macroeconomic stability, the need to, uh, you know, w reduce interest rates, inflation rate, and also ensure debt sustainability. You've talked about a bit about debt sustainability, having to increase our revenue generation. How about interest rates and inflation rates? What do we do to ensure that we're able to bring them down? Actually, inflation, because it's annualized, that's the first start for because it's a year on year, Inflation. So once this year inflation has been so high, next year we see inflation fall. But inflation has gone up because there's been excessive borrowing. Okay. So government uh, expenditure has gone up, and that is fueling the borrowing. And once you are borrowing, interest rates are going up, and then the central bank tries to fight it by raising the policy rate. You know, so um, once we are able to contain expenditure and we start reducing the borrowing, we see inflation also declining. And of course, with the balance of payment support, we seek to get from the fund and then the budgetary support from the World Bank. We should see some strengthening of the currency. So, uh, whether we like it or not, the future of this economy hinges on a successful fund program. The president has said it, the minister has alluded to it. We need a fund program in place. So we'll bring discipline. And once we have discipline, we'll see improvements in the macro indices of our past. Uh, we've always witnessed on our fund program. In between 2009 and 2012, and the fund program on that, there's a mix. That was the best period where we saw inflation in single digits for about 36 months. Uh, in the last program between 2015 and 20, 
2019, although it derailed before the uh, election. Later on, we restored uh, Marcos. And so, any time we've had a fund program, there have been improvements in macroeconomic uh, um, situation. And it, it's good for the economy because people have lost about 55% of their savings this year through uh, currency weakening and then uh, inflation increases and all. So I think it behoves on us to get this right. And I've heard people say that, oh, this should be our last time of going to the sun. I disagree. I think when we are with the sun, we get things done right. Why, why do you disagree? I mean, can't we do things right and not go back? Because we haven't shown that we can do things right. That's why this is the 17th time, and I say it will not be the last time. Because once we get out of a fun program, then um, we, we, we spend like drunken sailors, you know? We, we have never been disciplined when we are not at that fun program. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with being a uh, fun program. You might not necessarily go for financing. But technical advice, uh, the fund has given the Ghana Revenue Authority a lot of help. Even the central bank, there's always engagement. So technical advice, you can exit a fund program, but still have a standing agreement with them. So that they always come in and they help you prepare your budgets, your revenue administration, monetary policy. This, these are the kinds of engagement we should have when, when, when we are exiting a fund program. A continuous engagement with the fund. Now, now, I mean, talking about a fund program, the finance minister has been has indicated that you know, hopefully by end of December, we'll get a staff level agreement. Fitch is indicating that by uh, probably end of first quarter, second quarter, we may get on to a fund program. So we have about uh, some six to seven months, all things being equal. Uh, but then, till we get on to the fund program, till we get some bit of balance of payment and credibility, what would happen to these macroeconomic indicators? Well, until then, we are on our own. You know, that's why we should have gone earlier, because these negotiations take time. Now, even though the staff-level agreement is a prerequisite for going to board, it doesn't mean it's the board that decides ultimately. So you can have a staff-level agreement by any year, and the board can reject that staff-level agreement. So what is really key is to have a board-level agreement. Because even at the African region level, at that level, there has to be some uh, signing off before it goes to the main board. So ultimately, a board level agreement and a, a, a statement issued there of saying that the IMF today has completed an agreement with Ghana, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that is what I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. The staff level agreement, yes, it's important, but that, it, it means little. But f f funny enough, when you say until then we are on our own, does it mean things are going to get worse? 2023 is going to be a difficult year. If you look at the austere measures that are coming in the first uh, five, six months, like you are saying, it's possible we don't have a board. Uh, 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 we will not have an agreement until maybe second quarter of uh, 2023. So that balance of payment support is not coming. In the last six months, we've seen the cost of borrowing go now. 91 days is around 35%. Yeah. Inflation, we haven't seen the end of it. Even though we are 40%, inflation will end up again because uh, there's going to be uh, salary increases, negotiations are ongoing. Uh, once the currency weakens some more, we expect to lead to increases in poor prices. And so I, I don't think it's in the end of inflation. So we need the farm program as early as yesterday. Once it's in place, the bank, uh, World Bank will come on board. Uh, African Development Bank will come on board. European Union, the bilateral. But if you don't have a fund program in place, they will not mind. So there's a catalytic effect of, uh, of in having a fund program. All of these, the U.S., uh, the U.K., Germany, they will, they will support you. So uh, we need a fund program. Let me bring Honorable Setek Bain at this point. Um, uh, Dr. Mark Asibayabua says, we need the fund program. Until then, we are on our own. And if we are on our own, uh, it means we're going to get worse. Honorable Setek what can we do while waiting for a fund program to ensure that we don't, the situation doesn't get worse? Finally, from you. 
<laughs> what we can do is to accelerate our engagement with the fund and get a fund program because the consequences we have tried to be on our own. I remember, we got between 2020 and 2021, 6 billion US dollars, I'm not talking cities, US dollars in support of COVID. In addition to 2 billion, that's 8 billion, you know, uh, bonds before we could not go back to the markets again. And uh, not to mention other things, 8 billion is quite significant. And that is what should tell you that there was a problem with the economy pre-2020, you know, which keeps, you know, uh, uh, going at us. Uh, and so I think what we can do is just to be, you know, uh, very uh, uh, serious in getting a fund program. Because the reason why the fund is important is that the fund is the lender of last resort for developing countries. You know, the U.S. can have its deficits. They are the dollar. You know, advanced countries are their euro. The emerging countries have moved, you know, gradually to the intermediate stage, which Dr. Sibe was talking about. What you do is to rely on the fund. He mentioned revenue. He mentioned central bank. In fact, the fund was at the table when we were doing gift mix on the expenditure mm. side. That is the technical assistance aspect of the IMF, which is often unsung because of the austerity. You know, that because the technical assistance is often associated, you know, with austerity. But on a daily basis, fiscal affairs departments, monetary and credit and the statistics and others, they are there to assist us as member countries, you know, of the fund. Now, the problem, let me retreat a point which Dr. Sibe made, if what we also have to do. If we do not tackle expenditure, if we do not tackle expenditure seriously under this program, we will not get anywhere. And the reason I'm saying is that we have already gone through this morning the raft of revenue, you know, measures, you know, whether you like them or not, which we have taken from levies 16 to revenue. Uh, we are about to talk about property tax. I have my views on that. We are doing a lot on the revenue side. And yes, so we have a gap. And that is because our revenue is 16%. Our expenditure is about 20%. And so for as long as you keep having this 4 to 5% gap every year, you are going to borrow because that's the only way you can finance the expenditure. And when you borrow, and because the sinking fund is gone, because stabilization fund is gone, you do not have those buffers which we were creating, which are the buffers that we need if we want to get ourselves out of a fund, you know, situation where we manage ourselves. And as Dr. CB said, and I've been pointing out the time, you move to what you call a, a policy support instrument stage where you go to the fund only when it becomes that, like the COVID, you know, era, right? So these are the things that we need to do, but immediately we need a fund program because if there were alternatives, you know, in getting us out of this situation, we would have gone for it by now. I mean, that is a, that is a simple thought. If we had any alternative, given the stance of the government, you know, which caused the delay, that they were not going back to the fund, you know, whatever be the case and resulting in the delay, we would have seen that, you know, situation already. I think the flagship programs and others, there is a need for a conversation, such as was done, you know, since and other places, a dialogue so that we move forward. Mm -hmm. So this is the expectation that one wants to get you know, from the uh, budget, you know, that the proposals that are on the table will convince the staff of the Africa department led by the mission chief and supported by the rest rep office in Accra. That is what the staff level means. And as Dr. CV said, the stage between the staff agreement and the board is that the staff agreement will be circulated to all the departments. And the reason it goes to all the departments is that if there is a tax proposal, as we are discussing, if there is an expenditure proposal, which we are not discussing, it is the fiscal affairs department of the IMF that will have to comment on it. It's not Africa department, because that's where the expertise is. If there's a proposal which says that, you know, Bank of Ghana must reduce, you know, its deficit financing of the budget, 
and get back to zero financing. Remember, we got to that point. Yeah. It wasn't easy, but those are the steps you need to win yourself off you know, the fund. Those proposals will go to the monetary the division of the IMF and so on and so on. They have those who deal with social intervention in FAD who would have to look at. So all these departments of the fund would have to look at it. If you need capacity building, the capacity building department would have to come in. They are the ones who come and assist GRA with their revenue and others. The World Bank and others will also come in. Now, when those, it goes to the departments, they will come with their comments. And then the staff level agreement you have would be sent back to the authorities with those comments. There may be another round of negotiations. And let's cut it short. Assuming that you succeed in doing all of this in one month or two months, sorry, in one negotiation or two, then it is time to circulate that document with the departmental comments to every director of the board. Because as Dr. Sibis said, they are the ones who are going to vote. And their staff, including the Ghana staff, that is in our executive director's office, you know, who will comment and who will give you know, the government's comments to our executive director to defend the position at the board. It is then that all of these comments will come in again. If there was a need, the authorities will come back. If the US director, you know, who maybe through USAID and others, you know, has requested because they are going to be providing the support. You see where the bilateral is coming. Mm. If there's a UK director who is going to look at what the UK, he would have to consult you know, with home office in London and then back to Accra, they will, they will do all this background work. And it is only then that you will have a board. You fix a board meeting or agree on a board meeting and you would have a program. We are not having a program with a staff level agreement, no. And already we are told that the debt sustainability analysis, you know, is one of the major issues that, you know. So uh, to, to, to summarize what I said, we need to look critically at expenditure because we have thrown a lot, you know, at expenditure. We'll be discussing property taxes. I have my view on that. We've thrown a lot. We need automation of the domestic tax division of GRE. We need to restart or continue the giftness, you know, many of budget expenditures and the rest. That is where the fiscal discipline breaks down and you end up with corruption. Sometimes yeah. it is not based on vouchers that are being passed. It's not based on only procurement, but it's because you lack the system, the electronic system. We were talking about EVAT. If you have EVAT and GRE does not have a comprehensive automation system, you know, to offset, as I said, you have to offset the input VAT against the output VAT. Remember, I was well, I will you, you know what we're going to do? Uh, because we're going to yeah. come back. We're going to come back after 10 a.m. and continue with the conversation. Uh, let's end it at this point. Uh, we'll come back and continue. And I hope that uh, uh, Dr. Marcus Ibeyebo can also join us uh, on Joy News and on Joy FM as we build up to the 2023 budget presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Marcus Ibeyebo, uh, who is a former member of Parliament for New Jabbing South and former chairman of the Finance Committee in Parliament and also Honorable Seth Tekpe, former finance minister. Thank you very, very much for joining us. Stay with us. We'll be right back after these You're messages. Welcome. Show.